Hey, thank you for joining us today for our Blue Christmas service. This is a service that we've done before since I've been here in the church. It's a service that I've always wanted to do, and I'm thankful the last few years that we've been able to do it. This year's different. Um, this is a service that is emotional. It's a service where we name our pain, name our hurt, and name the things that may keep the Christmas season for being for us a time that is joyful. For many of us, this season's hard. Maybe this is the first Christmas you've had without a loved one. Maybe this is the first Christmas you've been alone. And then especially in COVID, we've lost a lot, haven't we? I think about the grief, I think, that is simmering inside of so many of us and simmering, in fact, in our nation. I wonder if that's why sometimes we're so angry is because we're really processing the hurt that we have. So let's think about all that we've lost in 2020. We've lost, for many of you that are parents of seniors who graduated in March, in May rather, you lost a graduation. Some of our seniors lost prom. Some of our athletes lost a season. As the father of a band parent, we lost marching this summer, this year. But things that are okay, it's not the end of the world. But it hurts, doesn't it? It's a grief, it's a pain. And then you add on to that the, the, the tons of other losses. You may be watching this service and you've lost a spouse or a child or a parent or a friend or a coworker to COVID. You may have lost your job because of this pandemic. You may be lonely right now. You may feel isolated. For so many of us right now, there's a lot of pain in our life. There's a lot of hurt in our life. There's a lot of loss in our life. And the Blue Christmas service is a service where we get to name that, where we get to own that, where we get to say aloud to God and to others, yes, this is the hurt that I feel. And yes, I know that Christ is born and he's the Prince of Peace. And yes, I know that it's going to be okay. But right now I'm hurting. And normally with the last few years we've done this service in Hart Hall, Ants has helped. It's been a more of a laid-back contemporary service. This year I've been playing around with doing it in the sanctuary and doing it a little bit more liturgical with more prayers and, of course, <laughs> COVID. So here I am talking to you one-on-one uh, -on -one in front of the Christmas tree here in the sanctuary. So COVID's even affected this service that talks about pain and loss. So what we're going to do in this time of worship is you're going to see in just a few minutes one of my favorite anthems that our choir has done this year. It's, it's a beautiful rendition of the beloved hymn, Draw Me Nearer. And it, it's a song that's always spoken to me because the only way we make it through the difficult seasons and times in our life is for Christ to draw us nearer. And it's, I like this song because the melody and the tune is a little different. And it's always made me listen to the words differently, and, and it really draws me in. So as I was thinking about what the service needed to look like, I wanted to use this anthem from our choir, our ensemble, as a point of reflection, a chance for us to stop and to think about our losses. And maybe, you know what, maybe you haven't thought much about that. Maybe you haven't really considered the losses that others have faced. Maybe you've been very fortunate and have not had a lot of losses. I'll be very honest with you. My family's been relatively fortunate this year. We've not... Every loss that we've had this year as a family has more or less been an inconvenience. We, we've not had many major losses. Even in regarding work, my wife's been able to work from home. I've been able to keep plugging along at church. My kids have done fine. But for many of you today, your losses have been more than an inconvenience. They've been sources of great pain. And we need to have the place and the time and the space to name that. And so for some of you, this service might not be something that you need right now. That's one of the good things about us recording this and streaming it out later is that you can watch this whenever you'd like to. It'll remain on our website. It'll remain on Facebook and on YouTube. And it'll be there for you maybe whenever it is that you need it. The service will look different. It's going to just be me. And then you're going to see a video from the, from the choir in just a moment. I'm going to reflect with you in just a few minutes on some scripture. But here's what I want you to hear. You're going to see across the screen right now 
you're going to see my email address and the church phone number. I can't pray with you right now in person with you. I mean, you're watching this wherever you watch it, at home, on your phone, wherever you are. But as a pastor, I want to be able to be there with you, whatever your pain is right now. And, and perhaps you're already in a church. I would love, first off, I, I would encourage you to reach out to your pastor for any pain that you're feeling right now. I mean, if you don't have a pastor, I'd be honored if you would trust me enough to allow me to pray for you in this time. So contact me if you are in need of prayer. Contact me if you need somebody to pray for you. Contact me if you need someone to talk to. I'll, I'll be glad to meet with you. We can do it in a safe distance, a safe place. We can do it virtually. We can do it one-on-one -on -one in, a, in, a, in a space. We can do it wherever we need to. But I'd love to be able to be there for you if you need somebody there for you. But most of all, I want you to know that God's there for you. So now I'm going to invite you to listen to our St. Matthew's Ensemble as they sang this beloved hymn of the, of the faith earlier this year. I want you to pay attention to, to the words. I want you to listen to what the song is saying. And then after, after that, I'm going to share with you a few words of encouragement that might comfort you in this season. But this is what I want you to hear above all else. Everyone's joyful right now. It's okay if you're not. It's okay if you're not joyful. It's okay if you're angry. It's okay if you're lonely. It's okay if you're hurt. Well, these things aren't okay. But if we can't name them, if we can't name them, if we can't give them that God will never fully recover from the pain that we feel, or the loss that we feel, or the hurt that we feel, it's okay not to be okay. Because the only, only way we'll ever get okay, the only way we'll ever recover, is to name these things and to give them to Jesus. So my prayer for you as you listen to our ensemble sing right now is that you can allow the Holy Spirit to be at work within you to either name these things that are hurting in your life, call to your mind things that are hurting, and be in prayer for others who are hurting. So I invite you to listen to our St. Matthew's ensemble as they sing, Draw Me Nearer.
I wanted to share with you a passage of scripture that's always meant a lot to me, and it's going to be one you may find interesting, but I think one that's appropriate for this season. Uh, it's going to come from Matthew 23. It's going to be verses 27 through 39. Matthew 23, 37 through 39. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. But I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. That reading comes at an interesting time in Jesus' ministry. He is finishing up his teaching ministry in Matthew, getting ready to go to the cross. It's interesting if you look at where exactly this passage finds itself. This is a passage that comes right after um, Jesus, some of Jesus' harshest teaching. He, um, earlier in um, chapter uh, 23, he has uh, what's called the seven woes. These are the seven woes to the Pharisees and to the religious leaders, criticizing them for their legalism and for their refusal to hear his word and refusal to follow him and how they're leading others away from him. And it, it's, it's some of the, the harshest language Jesus uses in all the scriptures. So he finishes this hard teaching, and then he, 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 he's, he's looking out over Jerusalem, um, where he would have where he would have addressed this the Pharisees and Sadducees would have been on the place called the teaching steps. The teaching steps are would have been steps leading up to the temple under underneath the Sanhedrin. And anyone who would have come to have taught would have taught from that place because you could look up and address the religious leaders, and the religious leaders could look down and either give approval to your teaching or give judgment to your teaching. Normally, people would come to the teaching steps and would offer words of praise to the Pharisees and Sadducees and to their teachings and to the law. Jesus comes and just destroys them. I mean, just, just in some of his harshest language in all the Bible, criticizes them, their teaching, their ethics, everything, their integrity, the whole nine yards. But then what's interesting, if you were to turn away from the Sanhedrin and look over to the, um, uh, to turn to the other side to your right, you see the Mount of Olives, the way the path Jesus would have come down on the on on Monday Thursday. You see the tombs gleaming white. In fact, one of the criticism he says to the Pharisees is that they're like whitewashed tombs. They could have seen from their position. They could have looked out and seen the Mount of Olives with with all the whitewashed tombs upon it for purity, and, and so others could see. So Jesus had just finished his teaching of the religious leaders, and he turns from them and turns to look out over the city because the temple's at one of the highest spots in the city. And then he turns, you can, all, you can really see Jerusalem laid out before you, particularly in this day, in Jesus' day, you can really see Jerusalem laid out before you. So he sees Jerusalem. And for me, when I read this passage, let me read it to you again. Listen to it. Because I'll tell you what I hear when I, when I read this. Jerusalem, the Jeru Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I have desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. I hear heartbreak in Jesus' voice when he says this. Remember in Genesis 1, it says that, that the Godhead, the Trinity, said, let us make man in our image. Jesus Christ has been present throughout the creative, creative process of creation. He's been present throughout all things. And it wasn't just the Father who loved Israel. It wasn't just the Father who loved the people. It was Jesus as well. So Jesus has longed, as his Father has, as the Spirit has, as the Godhead of the Trinity has longed to gather his people together in freedom and safety and in joyful obedience. And here you see he has just criticized the religious leaders in the harshest language that he can. And here you see him saying, oh, Jerusalem, 
How I've longed to gather you together under my wings as a hen would her brood. But you would not let me. When, when I read that passage, I, I hear the heartbreak of Jesus. I hear the heartbreak of Jesus. I, I hear Jesus heartbreaking because he longed to be in relationship. And he longed to be at peace with his people. But they would not let him. They refused. They refused to be gathered under the wings. They refused to walk with him. They refused to accept his grace. They rejected him outright. And so the very one who made them, the very one who gave them life, the very one who is the very who holds all things together, as Paul tells us in Colossians, the very Son of God now sees his creation rejecting him and his heart's broken because he longed to gather them together but they would not let him. We can skip over to John's gospel where Jesus weeps beside the tomb of this friend Lazarus. I think one of the worst mistakes we can make with Scripture is that we can sanitize it. Is that we can take the pain and loss away from Scripture. We far too often have made our faith, or we try to make our faith like some type of protective shield against pain and against loss and against hurt. We were watching The Incredibles, that Disney superhero movie, Pixar, about the super family, and the, the daughter has the ability to create a force field around the family, around herself, around whomever. And nothing can penetrate it. And you're inside the force field, you're safe, it's okay. We've often thought faith was like that, haven't we? Well, I'm a Christian, so it, it's going to be okay. I, I say that a lot. I say that a lot. It's going to be okay. But let me tell you what I mean when I say it's going to be okay. When I say it's going to be okay, I, I don't mean that it's going to be perfect. I don't mean it's going to be pain-free. I don't mean it's going to be easy. I don't mean there's not going to be tears or hurt or loss or pain. Because Jesus experienced all that. We read him saying, I longed to gather you together, but you would not let me. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I've longed to gather you together under my wings as a, as a hen would her brood, but you would not let me. See, now it's left you desolate. Oh, I've longed, I've desired to gather you together, but you would not let me. To say it's okay is not, to me, that there's not going to be heartbreak. Because it is. Uh, C.S. Lewis said something to the effect of one day, we were promised suffering. Because Scripture says, blessed are those who mourn. We're going to face pain. When I say it's going to be okay, it, I'm not saying it's going to be painless. And I'm not saying it's going to be griefless. In fact, I'm saying quite the opposite that there is going to be pain and there's going to be loss. We're watching this, we're, we're recording this, you're watching this probably in late December. We're going to have more loss with COVID, y'all. We are. Hopefully not much more, but we are. I've got multiple, maybe you're watching this, you have it. I've got family that have it and friends that have it. We lost a beloved Methodist minister this week. There's loss. I'm not saying there won't be loss. What I'm saying is it's going to be all right. What I'm saying is it's going to be all right. 
Paul says that when we suffer, our suffering can draw us closer to Jesus. Our, in our suffering, we find the sustaining grace of Jesus. And when we suffer, we find God's hand with us even in the difficult times. I don't want you to ever think that your suffering, your pain, invalidates the love of God or invalidates God's love in your life or invalidates God's presence in your life because we're all going to suffer. We read about Jesus' sufferings a few minutes ago. We read about Jesus having loss and pain and hurt just a few minutes ago. I don't want you to ever think that your suffering invalidates God's love for you or God's presence for you because it doesn't. And I also don't want you to think that you've got to always be happy. I think that's that's one of the greatest mistakes we've made in our faith and in our life in this time is that we pretend like we've we've always got to be happy. And we don't. I I have a terrible poker face. My staff knows when I'm in a bad mood or when I'm a little upset and a little depressed. I'm I'm actually quite melancholy a lot. I do a good job faking it. And I do a good job of um, being a preacher when I need to. But there's, my wife can tell you, there's, there's been a lot of times in my life I've struggled with melancholy, struggled with depression. It's okay. Being a Christian is not a hedge against all these things that are happening. Being a Christian means that we have somewhere to turn to. We have a safe harbor. That we have a place of safety in the storm. And being a Christian means that we know that when the suffering and the pain and the loss come, that it is going to be okay. Because our God's not left us. And our God's not forsaken us. This year I've lost a lot of family not so much to COVID but just to life and I I did the funeral recently for a cousin that was very tragic very sad it kind of put me in a funk for a while afterwards and and I I started looking at my family and when I was preaching when I was giving my reflection and looked out at my family that's seen so much loss these past few years and I told them that I'm proud of them. Because even though in the midst of loss, we've still kept walking and been faithful, even in the midst of sadness. But the Bible talks about these type of losses. But the Bible tells us over and over and over again that God doesn't leave us. In fact, if we look at the passage of Scripture that we love so much, the 23rd Psalms, it says, Yea, that I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou rod and thy staff, they comfort us. It doesn't say that we won't walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but it says that when we do, when we do walk through it, we won't fear evil. For God is with us. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. Comfort my people, O comfort what the scripture tells us. So today, whatever loss you're feeling, whatever pain you're going through, whatever hurt is on your heart, give it to Jesus. Now, giving it to Jesus doesn't mean it's going to get better tomorrow. It may not. It may take a while. It may take the rest of your life. I know I'm still figuring out how to grieve my mother's death 40-something years ago. I'm still processing that every day of my life. I'm processing it. I'm processing and learning to not hold on to fear and anxiety and trying to let go of them. And some days I do pretty good and some days I don't. And that's okay. Let go of it. Give it to God. Trust in Him. And hold on tight to Him. He's not going to let go of you. 
He's not going to let go of you. You may want to let go of him. (laughs) You may want to let go of him. But he's not going to let go of you. Because you're his beloved. Even if you don't feel it. Even if you don't believe it. Even if you don't understand it. You're his beloved. Hold on tight to Jesus. Hold on tight to Jesus. I read an article recently about a pastor whose children struggle with the faith. And he used to end every conversation with his kids when they were, when he kind of wandered away from the faith. He ended every conversation with this, don't give up on Jesus. And that's kind of stuck with me through this, this season, don't give up on Jesus. For those of you who have lost, I'm so sorry. I'm truly sorry for your pain and for your loss. And I want you to know I'll be praying for you. As I mentioned in the intro, reach out to me. I'd love to be in conversation with you, praying with you, there for you. I'm truly sorry for any loss you've had this year. Don't be afraid to name it, though. Don't be afraid to give it to Jesus. Don't be afraid to turn it over to him. And if you pick it back up tomorrow, it doesn't mean he's, he left you. It just means you might have to lay it back down again. Don't give up on Jesus. He's not giving up on you. Don't give up on Jesus. Love you. But more importantly, God loves you. And in this season, if you don't feel good, if you're blue, if you're upset, it's okay. Don't give up on Jesus. He's not giving up on you. Thanks for watching. You know that we're praying for you in the days to come. I hope that somehow in this season, you can feel the love of Christ. And know that you're loved. And that you're cared for. No matter what. Merry Christmas. Even if it's a little blue. Merry Christmas.